Um, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker today who's tuning in remotely from Europe, uh, Gabriele Corso. He is a PhD student at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, co-advised by Tommy Giacola and Regina Barzley. His research focuses on developing new deep learning frameworks to tackle challenging problems in structural biology and drug discovery. Um, I'll hand it over to Gabriele now. Thank you very much, Shani, and, and thank you very much to the rest of the organizers. Um, yeah, very happy to be talking about uh, today. I, can you hear me okay, John? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but, uh, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, Montreal. I was there last year, and, and it was great. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, machine learning in structure-based drug discovery and talking a, a bit about the kind of uh, an overview of the field and, and some of our work at MIT. And obviously uh, the work at MIT is definitely based uh, on collaborations with many people from my groups and around. So the main problem we're gonna be looking at and I'm gonna motivate why we get to this problem is the one of protein ligand drug uh, docking. And so here we have a protein and a small molecule. And we are looking to find the structure with which the small molecules binds to this protein. Sometimes we're gonna be given more or less information about this protein, for example, its structure, or you know, the particular pocket that it binds to. And we might be given also some information about the molecule. But typically just think about this as given a protein and a small molecule, we are looking to find this joint structure that the molecule and the protein will take when binding together. Now, why do we even care about this uh, bound structure? Where we can use this bound structure for many things. And number one, to predict affinity, which is the, the binding strength. And this can be done with the like, scoring function or with the molecular dynamics based uh, free energy perturbation methods. But also we not only care about you know, that final number of, of the affinity, we typically also care about understanding the key interactions. So which amino acids are uh, implicated in this interaction that we need the structure for, or to design better binders, we, uh, structure is very useful to kind of understand where things would fit better. And so, uh, you know, where does this fit in the overall you know, drug discovery process? Uh, multiple places, you know, one, uh, the most common one is virtual screening. So here, typically, often we have a target that we are trying to, to drug. And so we're trying to find some um, small molecule that binds to this specific target. And actually, I didn't mention it before, but this protein I've been showing is the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID main protease. And this small molecule here is um, Paxlovid, uh, the Pfizer drug. And so you can see that, you know, how uh, Pfizer must have, you know, looked for, you know, across a very large library for a small molecule that would fit and bind tightly to this uh, protein target. And so this is, this is used for hit discouragers or hit to lead, the lead optimization, various kind of stages. And, but it's also used in other settings where, you know, often we have a, a specific ligand and we're trying to do some kind of reverse screening to understand what proteins these ligands uh, binds to. This, for example, in the case of uh, mechanism of action identification, for example, you find the ligand that has some effect, you want to understand that effect, and you're looking for which targets these ligands bind to, to understand, yeah, it's mechanism of action, also kind of toxicity prediction, and so on. So hopefully kind of I've motivated uh, why we care about you know, predicting this, this joint structure between the protein and the ligand and how this is critical for many kind of downstream tasks in structure-based drug discovery. Now, one question that you might ask is, can we use molecular dynamics to, uh, to simulate it? And you know, uh, I know later today, you're gonna have some lectures on, on molecular dynamics, but can we use molecular dynamics to solve uh, docking. And here there is this, this simulation that uh, the show research made um, a couple of years ago, 
kind of showing the effect of, you know, kind of simulating for a long time a protein and a small molecule. And so here you can see that, uh, you know, uh, as we kind of run the simulation for uh, a few kind of microseconds, we can sort of mostly see where this ligand will bind to the protein. And so this is, in particular, this is probably the, in the, the pocket and the structure that we would want to find with docking. Now, the problem is that, you know, running these hundreds of microseconds of simulations that we need, especially for, you know, average, these are pretty small, average size proteins and ligands take hundreds of GPU days. And so for, for a single complex, and this is not something that can be can be really scaled to the to the settings that I was showing you earlier, where you need to screen you know many different ligands or many different proteins. And so this is kind of why researchers rely on docking methods to find good structure prediction, which may be used in very different ways. You know, for example, even as uh, being fed to molecular dynamics, for, for example, downstream free energy calculations. Okay, so let's review a few different approaches that people have taken uh, over the years to, to the docking problem. And to kind of, you know, help me visualize some of these methods, I'm gonna sort of like project down these distributions I was showing you uh, in 3D to just a 2D uh, diagram. And so, you know, the pose that we are interested in, the pose from the intuitively you can think about as the pose we would get from crystallography or the lowest energy pose. Um, we are going to represent it as this, this green dot. And then we are going to represent as this 2D distribution, a projection of the model uh, posterior distribution. So this is both the natural uncertainty, so the uncertainty about you know, where the ligand may go, and the model uncertainty on top of it, which is you know, the fact that the model even though some poses might be incorrect, the model might still have some, some confidence over them because of just its uncertainty. And so, uh, so yeah, so this is how I'm gonna represent it. Keep always in mind, obviously, when I'm gonna be presenting the fact that we're always gonna be talking about this very, very complex distribution that it's in very, very high dimensions. So this is, I'm representing it as a 2D uh, distributions, but this is a distribution that lies in a very high dimensional space. Even just considering the ligand, if the ligand has like 50, let's say, high V atoms, this is gonna be 150 dimensional, very rugged space. But we're gonna use this simple 2D distribution as a, as a mock-up. Okay, so the first class of methods is, which were kind of the most, the traditional methods, are what I'm gonna be calling search-based methods. So this one I have like a search algorithm or like an optimization algorithm that looks over um, poses or uh, thousands or sometimes even millions of poses and then ranks them using a scoring function. And this scoring function sometimes it's like a physics-based scoring function, sometimes it's learned, but the critical component of, of the algorithm, which is this uh, search, Algorithm, it's typically something that is kind of set in advance. The problem with this is that because of the fact that this search procedure is somewhat blind, uh, it kind of fails to grasp when the search space is very large. And so this is particularly the case, for example, for, for blind docking. So this is the case where we don't know in advance where the ligand will bind. If we know the pocket in advance, this somewhat restricts our search space. Furthermore, even more it struggles when we have to integrate flexibility of the receptor. Because once we integrate flexibility of the receptor, we increase the amount of degrees of freedom and we decrease the ability of this uh, scoring function to really just be able to look for like a key lock mechanism. And so both when there is some flexibility and when we are uh, docking to computationally generated structures, which are either imperfect or just are somewhat flexible because there is some flexibility in the protein. And this is why we've seen in some uh, papers in the past couple of years, papers saying basically that, you know, AlphaFold didn't really have an impact on many, many aspects of structure-based drug discovery because, you know, docking methods couldn't, couldn't work with AlphaFold structures. 
So in the um, excited by the kind of alpha fold development, uh, a few groups try to kind of apply the same techniques that were very, very successful with alpha fold two uh, to docking and try to improve over this search phase paradigm. And so here, the idea was that with the regression model, we could directly in one shot, you know, find the structure of our uh, protein ligand uh, complex. And the problem with this is that um, the way that it kind of treats uncertainty uh, is that it treats uncertainty doing an averaging. So here, once again, here I'm considering the posterior distribution of the model and the model, um, this posterior distribution is going to have a certain mean. And here I'm assuming that we are using uh, um, an L2 kind of loss, but similarly with, with other kinds of losses, we are going to have kind of a loss over these multimodal distributions and we are going to get something like the mean. And this mean, especially in very high dimensions, is likely going to be something that is very, is very far from the ground truth that we care about. And it's, as I'll show you, it's often going to look unphysical. And so this is why when we look at the benchmarks, even though these methods that were proposed were faster, they didn't really improve over the, the quality of our search based methods. And here I'm kind of showing the standard benchmarks for blind docking and looking at the, uh, the percentage of complexes where the ligand gets within two Armstrong, which is kind of cor uh, considered the correct prediction. And so you can see uh, that the predictions of this red, uh, this uh, regression models was pretty similar to the ones of the uh, search based methods that came before. And so what we proposed in our iClear paper uh, a couple of years ago was uh, to actually employ generative models for this task. And so the idea here was to directly sample uh, this posterior distribution and sample it multiple times, hopefully uh, getting the different modes, and then we can uh, potentially select which mode we are most interested in. And you can see here, as I'll show you in the next couple of slides with some real examples, there is a better, more correct, arguably, uh, handling of, of the uncertainty. And so let me give you a couple of actual real world examples. So here, this is uh, this protein in gray is actually a drug target against malaria. And you can see in green, uh, the, the crystal structure of two uh, inhibitors that binds to these two different spots. If we run a regression method, what we are gonna get, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is a results that kind of looks like an averaging of the two different poses. And on the other hand, uh, with the generative model that I'm gonna kind of present, we are actually able to sample both modes of, of this distribution. Similarly, even though here, there isn't really some natural uncertainty, as far as we know, there is only one um, binding structure of this ligand to this protein, you can still see that these regression methods, this averaging in these regression methods causes you know, some steric clashes of the ligand with respect to the protein, some very unphysical conformations, and so on. And so with this, you know, I kind of hopefully have motivated kind of why we went along this path of trying to build a generative model for, for this task of, of molecular docking and, and why we're interested in molecular docking at all. And, you know, actually in previous, uh, you know, iterations of this presentation, I had to uh, even do a bit more, more, uh, level of convincing these days, you know, people, uh, a lot of people are very, first of all, are very familiar with generative models, but also, you know, with the recent uh, also advances, for example, from AlphaFold3, which also adopted this idea of using uh, diffusion generative models, in particular diffusion models for structure prediction, this has kind of become somewhat uh, of an easier sell. But let's kind of look at kind of how we actually uh, build this generative model for, for molecular docking. So first, let me give you a very quick introduction to, uh, to diffusion models. And, you know, I imagine you're going to hear uh, along this uh, summer school, you're going to hear a few introductions to 
diffusion models. So I apologize for the repetition, but I think you know it's going to be useful to to define a few things that we're going to need later on. So uh, you know any generative models uh, is finding a way of mapping a simple distribution so like a Gaussian to a complex distribution. That's the data that we are interested in. And uh, diffusion models do this by starting from a forward diffusion process, which does the opposite: it maps the initial uh, our initial distribution to a Gaussian by uh, repeatedly adding more and more noise in in Euclidean space. Once we have defined this forward uh, diffusion, we then need to learn using some uh, deep learning kind of architecture we need to learn the score of this evolving data distribution. So the score is the gradient of the uh, log density. And you can see here T because this is uh, the score, it's evolving over time. And so in particular here is this, this vector field that hopefully you're able to see uh, these vectors kind of indicating towards the, the regions of higher, uh, higher mass. And, and finally, once we have learned this score, thanks to a results that was actually proven um, by some physicists in the 80s, we're able to sample uh, our um, uh, distribution of interest by running the diffusion in reverse. And so we run the reverse process and we get the Gaussian and uh, end up at our distribution. And you can see that this uh, reverse diffusion process only depends on some parameters that we had defined at the start and our score that we have just learned. Okay, so this is was a very quick introduction to diffusion models. And now we're gonna see how each of these components was defined in our specific case. So let's start from the forward uh, process. So a ligand pose, as I mentioned before, kind of like here we are assuming that we have a protein structure and we assume the protein structure to be fixed. Uh, so we are just uh, given kind of the, our degrees of freedom are going to be the pose of the ligand. So the positions of, its, of all of its atoms. And so let's say that the ligand has n atoms, then these uh, positions are going to be an element of r to the free n. Uh, so the free n dimensional uh, Euclidean space. And so if we run the diffusion that I showed you in the previous slide over this uh, ligand pose, we obtain uh, something that, that looks like this. And you know, whether you are like a chemist or physicist, or even, you know, even if you just took some uh, chemistry classes in, in high school, this, you know, this definitely doesn't look to you like a, um, like a reasonable uh, molecule. And kind of why does it not look like a reasonable molecule? Why does kind of this uh, diffusion process kind of look unreasonable? And the reason for that is that actually kind of docking involves far fewer degrees of freedom than what we are um, destroying here. So, you know, for example, bonds are pretty much of a fixed length between, between uh, like a pair of bonds. And so we don't need to diffuse, you know, this degree of freedom too much. And so kind of following also an idea that was uh, originally kind of used also by some uh, of the traditional search-based methods, we kind of decompose the different degrees of freedom in the task between the rigid road translation of the small molecule with respect to the protein. And then uh, we um, decompose the flexibility of the pose itself of the ligand between its local structures and its torsion angles. So local structures are the things that tend to be fixed, you know, for example, you know, bond length the angles between bonds and kind of the chirality and kind of ring structures. And the torsion angles instead are the most flexible components of uh, the molecular structure. And this is basically how the two different parts of the molecule uh, rotate with respect to each other uh, around the particular bond. So when you, we are rotating these torsion angles, uh, and the, the bond angles don't change. And so that's kind of why there is flexibility. And so uh, kind of following the idea already proposed by some of the traditional methods, we keep these local structures fixed and we define our diffusion process 
or only over this n plus six dimensional manifold defined by these other degrees of freedom. And where m is the number of torsion angles and six is the rotor translation and degrees of freedom. And to give you an idea, once again, for the average uh, drag-like molecule, we might have 50 heavy atoms. So we went from a 50 dimension, 150 dimensional space Typically, this 50 um, atom uh, molecule has around nine torsion angles. And so we go from 150 dimensional to a 15 dimensional space. So we decrease the number of degrees of freedom by an order of magnitude. And as I'll show you later on, this leads to having much more uh, sample efficient, uh, much fewer steps needed in our uh, diffusion process, and also a much easier um, uh, score for the model to learn. So we still haven't defined you know, how we are going to define the diffusion process, a forward diffusion process over this n plus six dimensional manifold. And, and here the problem is actually that this n plus six dimensional manifold is very complex because it's, uh, you know, we have, you know, it was relatively easy to define these degrees of freedom, you know, the bond length, the bond angles, the ring structures. But if you start, you know, try to think about it, you know, what is the space in you know free n dimensional space? I mean, it's it's hard to think about the free n dimensional space, but um, that we get when keeping you know all these different things fixed is some very complex Riemannian manifold, and so um, the challenge is that you know if we were to operate just in this n plus six dimensional manifold, we would require you know simulation to to do like any kind of forward diffusion. And so the idea that we proposed uh, in, in this work, as along with others, is the idea of what we call intrinsic diffusion models. And so here we are mapping this complex extrinsic manifold, this n plus six dimensional manifold, to a simpler, what we call intrinsic you know, uh, space. And in this case, it's like a product space. And here it's quite intuitive because, you know, positions, we can think of them as an element of R3, free, the three-dimensional. Uh, space orientation, we can think of them as an element of the rotation space uh, in three dimension, SO3. And torsions, we can think of them as being an element of a hyperdimensional torus. Now, there are two uh, still challenges. The first one is actually we need to define a unique way of mapping actions in this product space to action in this extrinsic manifold. And the challenge kind of comes when we actually go into the weeds of defining, you know, uh, these different degrees of freedom. We basically need to, for example, define a way of, you know, changing the torsion angles without changing the uh, orientation of the molecule. What does this even mean? And we use some kind of results that we prove in terms of, you know, linear and angular momentum and how this is equivalent to uh, a, a minimum RMSD alignment. But once we have defined this uh, uh, unique mapping between actions in the product space and the pose, now we just need to define the diffusion process on the product space, and this will map to a diffusion process in our manifold of interest. And we are lucky because uh, for product spaces, we can simply define uh, diffusion processes in each of the different uh, components of this product space and each of these different components are well-studied uh, Riemannian manifold. And so we know, you know what the tangent space is, what the heat kernel is, what the stationary distribution is. And these are all the components that are necessary to uh, defining the forward process and uh, training the model. Okay, so we have defined you know, what our forward diffusion uh, process is. Now we need to define you know, how we're gonna actually learn uh, the score uh, of this of this diffusion process and what kind of architecture we're going to use. And so, first of all, you know, while in this two uh, D example, the um, the score is an element of the same space. And this vector field, uh, the vector, this vector field is a, once again an element of the two uh, D Euclidean space. Uh, when we are working with uh, Riemannian manifold, we have to work on the so-called tangent space. And, you know, no, no need to really know a lot of Riemannian geometry for this. 
you can think of like a, a Riemannian manifold as being kind of like a curved space. And along this curved space at any particular point, we have a tangent hyperplane. And, and so our um, tangent space is simply this hyperplane that is uh, uh, tangent to our manifold at that specific point. And likely these actually have a relatively uh, easy to understand uh, equivalence. So for the position, obviously it's uh, once again R3 and you can think about this as a translational vector. For the space of rotations, this is uh, R3 and you can think about this as a rotation vector. So the, uh, the axis indicates the axis of rotation and the length of the vector indicates the uh, the magnitude of the rotation. And finally, the uh, m-dimensional torus, the tangent space is r to the m, and you can think of this as individual updates to every torsion angle. These have some symmetry with respect to SE3, and so we're going to build this symmetry in our score model. So the score model will take in the current protein ligand uh, structure uh, as basically a point cloud. And we'll basically make the prediction at every step of a translational vector, a rotational vector, and M different uh, torsion angles updates at each of these torsion angles. So you can think of all this prediction that the score model does as really being basically the direction in which the model thinks that the pose should be updated. Uh, to get closer to what it thinks is the is the right pose, and the the models that we're going to use to make these predictions are e three and n. And I know that Mario was talking yesterday, so hopefully by now you are all experts on e three and n's. Um, and this is a relatively standard e three and n uh, with the difference that in the final layer, since we have to aggregate representation for the whole ligand and, and all of these uh, torsion angles, we have very specific kind of aggregation types. But in general, you know, we chose uh, if we end because it's a very, uh, very, very expressive uh, type uh, class of, of uh, equivariant networks in 3D space, and they're rel relatively easy to, uh, to use. So a shout out to, to Mario. So we have defined this, um, how we're going to learn the score, how we're going to parameterize it. And, you know, we're going to learn it across, you know, many examples from our uh, data set. Now we can actually look at kind of what the result is when we actually run this reverse diffusion process uh, on, on the real example. And so here you can see uh, here the protein, the surface of the protein, and these are different samples, you know, randomly initialized. And in green, we have the uh, the true structure of in the crystal structure. And as we run this uh, reverse diffusion process, we only need about 20 steps because, as I mentioned before, by the fact that we have restricted the degrees of freedom, uh, this is a much lower dimensional, smooth manifold, so we can. Uh, we can we need far, far fewer steps. And so after only 20 steps, we can see that the model uh, takes a number of samples, all of which are uh, seem to be pretty accurate. So in terms of you know some quantitative results, uh, so just a couple of, of notes, you know here we're going to be training and testing on, on PDB bind. This is a standard benchmarks with uh, 19,000 experimentally determined crystal structures uh, curated from, from PDB. Uh, the traditional split, and I'm gonna be talking a bit more about this, it's based on the resolution date. So kind of the date that the particular complex um, was uh, resolved on. And uh, as baseline, we're gonna be considering you know, both um, the search base and kind of these deep learning methods. And finally, you know, I, I mentioned at the start, you know, here we're gonna, you know, we're assuming that we are taking some protein structure as an input. Uh, traditionally, you know, these documents are, are evaluated based on what's called the whole structure. So this is the actually the, the structure of the protein that the protein takes when 
in the crystal structure when bound to the complex. Now, the problem with this is that, you know, we, we are kind of running these docking methods because we cannot take, it's, it's unfeasible to take crystal structure of all complexes. So how do we know the crystal structure beforehand? And so this is kind of why we also evaluate in terms of what are called APO structures. So these are the uh, unbound protein structures. And in particular, we're gonna evaluate based on uh, APO structure obtained by something like alpha fold or ESM fold. So, so first in terms of holo, um, so first of all, we are looking here at blind docking performance. So here, uh, the models are not given the specific pocket where the ligand should bind. And here we're looking at holo protein, uh, holo protein structures, so the bound structure given as input. And you can see, you know, these are the results that I was showing you earlier, uh, saying that this, uh, these deep learning regression-based methods didn't uh, have any improvement over the classical search-based methods. Um, if you combine some pocket-finding methods, machine learning-based pocket-finding methods, and uh, some of these traditional search-based methods, you can obtain some improvement by kind of restricting the search and uh, where it's more is more promising. But you can see that DiffDoc does uh, kind of significantly better than these models. Uh, on, on this benchmark. Similarly, here we're looking at the same uh, set of complexes, but here instead we're giving, instead of the holoprotein structure, the APO structure generated with ESM fold. And here all the models are the same, so none of these models is trained on ESM fold structures. Uh, but you can see that uh, DiffDoc retains a much higher proportion of its accuracy. And as I mentioned at the start, these traditional methods based on kind of the search-based approach really struggle to do uh, to have any kind of significant uh, performance. Now, one challenge, and, and I mentioned, I, I would talk about this, is, is generalization. So uh, I mentioned before, this uh, benchmark is based on time split and also kind of ligand, ligand generalization. But it's kind of not looking at you know what happens when we um, try to run the model on uh, proteins that are very different from the ones that we were we trained on, and uh, the challenge is that um, it's you know, defining what it means for the protein to be different is kind of what was uh, what's non-trivial because what people have done in the past is looking at uh, protein similarity. Now, the problem with, with protein similarity splits is that you obtain somewhat of a similar uh, level of performance, and this is a time split. And the reason for that is that actually, even though two proteins might be uh, very different, and this is an example here in terms of sequence, the pockets itself is often evolutionarily well-preserved. And so because pockets are evolutionarily uh, very preserved, we have to look at the kind of a lower level than just the, the protein similarity to really evaluate this uh, generalization capacity of these models. And so, uh, so we did uh, this analysis and, and constructed a new benchmark in our iClear 2024 paper. And we created this new benchmark called DocGen based on uh, the uh, a split on the binding a protein domain. So here, you know, we look at, you know, the specific component part of the protein where the ligand binds, and we classify, you know, only the binding and uh, the protein domain of that uh, binding uh, site. And you know, when we look at the uh, the uh, results for both, you know, the search-based methods and the machine learning methods on this new uh, benchmark. And here we are basically uh, keeping the same model. So, so these are the models trained on the same data. We just collected an additional kind of test set uh, that does not have any binding domain in common with a protein, with a training set. And we can see that while the search-based methods you know, decrease some, a bit in accuracy, but they retain somewhat of a decent level, the uh, machine learning models really struggle uh, with this kind of generalization. And to give a, an intuition why they really struggle, as I mentioned, 
protein binding domains are very well conserved in uh, in evolution. And so there are actually only a couple of hundred of examples that these models actually see during training. And so this is that's why this is a very uh, challenging kind of, of generalization that the model has to do. But you can see that these regression met methods basically get uh, zero performance. Diff-doc also significantly struggles and gets about you know, seven percent, which is basically half of these traditional uh, observation methods, and a very very small amount of uh, its original performance on the on the time split where you know the ligands was unseen, but the protein was often something similar to what some uh, so what he has seen before. And so in, in our iClear paper, we kind of analyze this further and kind of uh, look into different strategies to improve this uh, generalization performance. And so one of the, some of the things that you might expect that work did indeed work, you know, for example, scaling the amount of, of data we scaled, you know, from, from just using PDB bind as a training set to also using uh, a data set called binding mod. We integrated this Vandermeers, which is a, um, a data augmentation techniques where we are sort of like generating synthetic data points uh, that we, we sample every once in a while. And further, we also do uh, a number of, of new techniques, you know, such as, you know, low temperature sampling and adapting the prior to the, uh, to the size of, of the protein that we are targeting to. And we obtain this new model, DiffDocL, which, as you can see, does significantly better than the uh, the original DiffDoc model, which was uh, it's this one also in in yellow. Um, also, yeah, scaling the model size seems to help, which is clearly a sign that we are in over parameterization regime. And and so you know, kind of uh, recapping kind of the results in the slides before, we can see that now we can. Uh, still do even in this binding domain split we can still do uh relatively well obviously there is uh degrees uh for for improvement but you know we are doing significantly better than we were doing before now obviously this um this 20 percent is not 100 percent, and it's definitely also lower than this uh 40 percent here 45 percent here and so, you know, kind of what we ask ourselves is, okay, how can we further improve this uh, generalization, um, generalization capacity? And especially improving this generalization capacity in, in a setting where we don't really have any further data, especially for the particular proteins of interest uh, that we want to, uh, to dock to. Uh, sorry, uh, and so this is uh, this is what we uh, we derive this this methods called confidence bootstrapping, and so the idea here is that a part of that I didn't mention about DiffDoc is that on top of the diffusion model sample different poses, we also trained a confidence model uh, that based on the final pose that was uh, was sampled basically ranks the different poses and says of oh, which ones it's more confident and which one is less confident. And this also is useful to return to the user a, a confidence estimate that can be used for, for downstream tasks. But here, can we, we ask ourselves, can we use the signal from this confidence model to fine tune our uh, diffusion model itself? And here, the idea kind of comes from the fact that, um, and this is somewhat well studied in the literature, ranking whether a pose is correct or not is much harder than you know uh, generating the pose in the first place and and so the confidence bootstrapping uh, works the following way so we we start from a given complex we have a number of diffusion uh, rollouts then we score with our confidence model, uh, these different rollouts, and maybe the confidence model we say, you know, some are higher confidence, some are lower confidence. And, and basically then we use uh, kind of confidence bootstrapping. We basically push the weights of our diffusion model to uh, sample you know, more often the, uh, 
the the pose or with a higher likelihood the pose of high confidence and fewer times the pose of low confidence and so once again kind of using the 2d distribution as a visualization you know maybe we start from uh, a posterior distribution in the model that looks like this and here right now the the true pose it's here so you can see that the model does put some uh, weight on this um, low likelihood, like on this this true pose, but most of the weight is actually um, is actually concentrated in in the regions in, in these other regions. And so, if we were to just uh, naively just sample this model, we would likely most most likely obtain samples from here. So what we do is that you know we run um, bootstrapping. So we run uh, and we obtain a, a number of samples. We um, we compute the confidence of each of these samples, and here I've tried to kind of color code it. So here the model is probably going to give higher confidence. Here is going to give lower confidence, and so we bootstrap ourselves. We bootstrap the weights of the model, and so we are going to get you know probably a distribution that kind of looks more. Uh, like this, so that it's kind of more focused around the kind of poses that we gave high confidence to. And now we can do another kind of bootstrapping iteration, obtain new samples, and so on, until basically we obtain a distribution that we can sample and with high uh, and high confidence get good uh, good results. To, uh, to validate this, uh, this idea, we, we tested it on fine-tuning uh, the model on specific protein classes where there was no uh, structural binding domain uh, available. So this is kind of the classes that were found in that doctrine benchmark that I showed earlier. And so the idea here is that, you know, let's say that we want to run a particular, like a screen or some other kind of uh, large scale uh, test on some proteins, a protein class that, it's, uh, that the model doesn't do very well on and there is not a lot of data, what we can do is use confidence bootstrapping to fine tune the model. And then uh, we kind of pay a bit of cost for this fine tuning. And then we can run with a much higher confidence the model on all the downstream kind of predictions without any need of, of fine tuning and so on. So, uh, so yeah, so we run kind of confidence bootstrapping on these unseen protein classes. And as expected, you know, because we are using the confidence to kind of uh, as a, a driving signal, we can see that over the iteration, the confidence of that the model at its own poses kind of increases. And what's important though, it's not the fact that the confidence increases, but that this actually translates improvement in docking accuracy. And this is what you can see here. This is uh, the small uh, diff dock model without before any kind of, uh, of fine tuning. And this is kind of the performance of other methods. And you can see how the performance uh, changes and increases overall over these bootstrapping iterations. And finally, yeah, you know, when looking at the performance on particular individual clusters, you can see the fact that for many protein families where there was some uh, level of performance, there was a, a, a large increase in the performance. So the model does a lot better. But on the other hand, you know, uh, when there was basically little or no no accuracy before, little or no coverage before, this uh, confidence bootstrapping doesn't provide a way of improving because basically the model doesn't is not able to sample you know high confidence poses and so it's not able to kind of bootstrap itself. So this kind of you know also directs to to some of the the future uh, lines of um, for for improvement. And uh, uh, with that, I would like to. Uh, Thank you, and kind of open open the floor to any possible uh, questions. And obviously, kind of thank my collaborators, my um, advisors, my collaborators. And here are some of the kind of resources uh, for uh, the DiffDoc paper uh, and the the DiffDoc L and Doctrine paper. 
and you can kind of contact me at um, by email or or on Twitter. And happy to take any questions that there might be. Well, thank you, uh, Gabriele. I so if everyone can turn around, Gabriele should be able to see us through this camera. So maybe we can give him a wave. Thanks for the talk. Can you see us? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm coming around with a microphone. If you have questions, yes, you have to speak in the mic. Otherwise, he cannot hear us. Hi, thanks so much for the great talk. Um, so I had a question. It's a little bit out of the scope of docking, but has anyone looked at if the confidence values correlate with true experimental binding? Um, and has this been tested on non-binders to see if um, basically the docking method shows that you know there wouldn't be actual docking? Great question. Um, so so yes, uh, there has definitely been quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of research in this direction. So I would say two things. On on one hand, uh, there have been people that have done this test, and there is some correlation between. Uh, the confidence model and whether or not something binds. This being said, uh, I would uh, say that you know the confidence model was definitely not trained to do this task, and for this reason, you know, first of all, has never seen neither any kind of affinity uh, value, nor has the model ever seen any non-binder. So it's basically just you know trying to dock and looking at the the docking pose, saying okay, this doesn't look like correct docking pose. And you know, if you can find any good docking pose, you know, there is some likelihood that you know the model, uh, the molecule just doesn't bind. So you know, there is some correlation, but at the same time, this is definitely not something that's been trained for that. And you know, there is a lot of ongoing research that we're doing uh, in our lab and and elsewhere on actually trying to improve these methods to do kind of affinity, both in terms of binary and and more more precise affinity. So I would say, yes, one can use it and there is some correlation, but at the same time, you know, hopefully uh, soon we're going to have something that's a lot better. Thank you so much. Hi, Gabriel. Thank you for your talk. So um, a, a quick clarification question. So uh, when you were defining that uh, the diff dock diffusion model, you, you described to us the reverse process, but in the forward process to be able to to train your diffusion model, um, how did you generate the forward process? Did you start from the docked pose and then uh, you ended up with the undocked uh, pose at the end of the diffusion? Yeah, so the way the way that you train uh, so these diffusion models is that you basically start, um, let me see what the best one to represent here is. So, so you start uh, you start with a given kind of pose. So assume that this is the uh, the the true pose. Or actually, let me let me go to the diffusion. So you you start with with the with the docked pose, and then you basically add noise. And and so here, assume that I've just added noise to that pose, and then you are teaching the model to basically go back to that pose. Now, how can you add noise in the kind of like uh, manifold that I described to you earlier using this intrinsic diffusion modeling paradigm is actually relatively easy. Like we are sampling, you know, like a rotation, a translation, and a change in torsion angles. And then we basically just apply it to, uh, to our ligand. And so, you know, we, we take the original ligand, we translate, we rotate, and we change the torsion angles. And then we teach the model to basically go back. And and how do you make sure that the pro the the ligand doesn't clash with the protein? We don't, uh, and this is kind of why I think you might see in the in the reverse diffusion process that some of the ligands basically pass through the protein, and so for sure, basically because of uh, you know the process, while you expect you know the final pose to be uh, somewhat physical. Uh, the process doesn't uh, necessarily have to be physical. And, you know, obviously we restrict the, the process to this manifold because it keeps, you know, uh, the ligand structure in a more physical perspective, but the ligand structure can definitely, along the diffusion process, can clash with the protein. This is sort of like, this is a bug, but also kind of a feature because 
this is, you know, this is the, the key difference between something like a diffusion model and kind of molecular dynamics. The fact that one way of seeing it is that you are over uh, over time, you're sort of like smoothing out uh, in a geometric way your energy function or your probability distribution, and and so obtaining a smoother and smoother uh, kind of distribution. And this is why you can sample this final pose basically in finite time. Uh, you know, with a, a molecular dynamic simulation or other kind of energy-based methods, you have to kind of run uh, Langevin, dynamic, uh, Langevin dynamics or other things like that for technically an infinite amount of time. Here, we can sample in finite time because we are able to, you know, uh, you know, teletransport, you know, go through kind of like this. Um, do, do you also end up hard. doing any final relaxations of those poses? Because uh, I see some of them are still a bit unrealistic. They're still kind of inside the protein. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, so definitely... Uh, this is, I mean, it really depends on what is the specific, you know, downstream application, but definitely like for, for many applications where, for example, one wants to run molecular dynamics downstream, we definitely recommend, you know, first uh, relaxing, relaxing the pose with the specific, you know, force field or energy function that you're going to use uh, downstream. Cool. Other questions. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so we'll try to keep it to one question per person. Um, yeah. Hi, Gabriele. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I have a question concerning the inference time uh, of such models, because I assume, you know, since you have to run the reverse diffusion process, that might take a long, long time. And I was wondering if this is suitable for applicability in like ultra large virtual screening, which have shown to be promising uh, uh, to find hits. Yeah, great question. So, uh, so to give an idea, I might have this in, in the supplementary slide, but I can just quote the numbers. So the uh, depending on the model, the, the smaller large module, these models typically take on a GPU between 10 and 25 seconds to sample a pose. Now, this is before any kind of uh, optimization that, that one, one can do. You know, for example, NVIDIA has done specific kernels for, for this, uh, for DiffDoc. And so it runs, you know, about three times faster. But let's say in the order of probably around 10, uh, five to 10 seconds per uh, pose. So obviously on, on GPU. So obviously, you know, you can kind of like, uh, depending on somebody's budget, you can kind of do the map. But, you know, it's unlikely that you would be able to probably run this in this uh, in this setting on you know like uh, the whole and I mean you know seventy billion uh, molecules. This being said, you know you you can probably relatively easily, especially uh, with you know future kind of optimization that hopefully will will come out, uh, can probably run it on hundreds of thousands of poses. And so you know figuring out how to do you know choose those hundreds of thousands of poses you know in the ultra large screen. It's it's uh it's definitely like a very important kind of question. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about how these doc gen clusters were made and how you decide the similar uh, binding sites across proteins and the number of uh, binding sites or number of data points you see in each of these clusters. Uh, which you describe as like a low data uh, regime. Yeah, so so the specific kind of like way of generating this is that we take the binding residues, so the residues that are within five Armstrong of the ligand. We look at the protein domain. You know, there are different like methods to classify. You know, to subdivide the protein within uh, each uh, protein domain. So we take the the largest represented protein domain uh, in this binding site. And then there are a number of methods that classify uh, evolutionarily uh, these protein domains. And in particular, we use one that is called ECOD. And so we basically use this ECOD classification to cluster a protein ligand uh, complex based on its kind of uh, the protein domain of its binding site using kind of the ECOD classification. And so then we kind of divide it in uh, clusters based on the, the code representation. 
And we get, you know, for example, on PDB buying, there are, I think, around 450 uh, clusters. Last question. And they are very, sorry, they are very different in terms of, I think you, you asked in terms of like the, the cardinality in each of these binding sites is very different. You know, one is like kinases. And so you can imagine there's like a lot of, a lot of data there, but, you know, obviously many of them are a lot more, a lot rarer. I, I think I have the last question here. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, maybe a bit of a naive question, but I was wondering if you could describe the difference between what the training process does and what the confidence bootstrapping does, because at least from a outsider, they look somewhat similar in what the model would be learning, but perhaps the confidence about bootstrapping is fine tuning. Yeah, so so the idea, it's, it's very similar. So the idea it's the the key difference is the way that basically you obtain the training data so when you're doing uh when you're doing training you start from a data point that you have in your uh, data set and you basically train the model to kind of recapitulate that when you're doing confidence bootstrapping you are training your model on uh, poses generated by the model itself so here we are, especially in, in settings where we have no structural data for these, uh, for these proteins, we cannot kind of use any kind of real data. So we sort of like have to use synthetic data generated by the model itself. Now, if you were just to just use basically the, the data generated by the model to train the model, obviously the model wouldn't change because uh, you're not kind of changing. But then we use the fact that the, this confidence model is doing this sort of re-ranking. And so the model will upweight the uh, poses that it generated that the confidence model is confident in and downweight the ones that the confidence model was uh, at low confidence. But from a practical perspective, they kind of then look similar in the way that you update the score. But you know, from, a, uh, from a data perspective, it's very different the way that, you know, the uh, the signal is extracted from and where the signal is extracted from. Uh, either on one side is just your training data, on the other side is the confidence model. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gabriele. Uh, we couldn't get all of the questions. Yeah, so if we have one more round of applause for Gabriele, that'd be great. Thank you.